losing time, I'm fading fast I just wanna make it last Try to let go of the past I close my eyes, embrace the blast Sleepless nights and headaches stack Restlessness to hell and back What's my purpose, what do I grab? A slippery surface, a heart attack And sometimes you just gotta believe There's something that'll give you relief There's something that'll have what you need what you need. Hi everyone, it's been a day. <laughs> like, I've pretty much been gathering enough video footage where I can post for like days at a time and take little breaks here and there, but yesterday was like the first time I haven't posted a long video <laughs> since I started. <laughs> and yeah, uh, for... I think, uh, oh, my ma mind is going like, woo, <laughs> where do we begin? <laughs> um, I guess we can just start with how I look today. <laughs> I did my, my hair is kind of like in its Nancy from the craft length. <laughs> and I did my makeup, tried to keep it a little more subtle today. My lips are really bothering me right now. But anyway, some good news. I'm like, finally, I'm almost in the 60s, just there. And I haven't been doing lo low carb this time. Like th pretty much any time in my life, I've like really lost a drastic amount of weight. I was like doing low carb. Like I did the South Beach diet and keto. And so to do things kind of just really trying to do it right this time where I'm like not really eliminating things and I'm just and I'm not starving myself and I'm my energy levels feel pretty good to my usual it's just um interesting actually when I first started losing weight and I hadn't I didn't feel like I was really changing very much um about my diet or exercise I kind of got worried because um it reminded me of people that I've known who kind of went when they're diabetic and their body just starts to eat away at the fat and muscle. I don't exactly know how that works. You'd have to look it up, but I know people who, I don't even know if it's type one or two. I don't know enough about diabetes, but it kind of just got me worried in the beginning thinking maybe I was at the point of no return where I screwed up this time and now I have diabetes but um even at my heaviest weight into now I was not only but I was kind of just at the point of almost becoming pre-diabetic so yeah that's something I need to take more seriously with my weight and you know it's not just about weight loss it's not just about looking good and stuff it's about hopefully like living a long healthy <laughs> life and reversing some of the damage and hopefully not getting diabetes because my dad was diabetic and um so I saw all the complications with that like first for starters he went from being like kind of a chunky guy to like bone thin like people probably thought he was an addict or something and then um and you know he had to get cataract surgery and um eventually led to kidney failure and then dialysis and then a kidney transplant and then you know you have to take medication that's like it, it makes me uncomfortable talking about my dad and I wish I could just call him by his name but I think I'd just prefer to keep saying dad like it's awful as much as I don't like that I mean I don't want to say sperm donor like he was still there in the household so I'm just going to keep calling him that and um anyway um you know once you get a organ transplant you're on medication for life that kind of keeps your immune system low so that your body doesn't fight the 
new organ from my understanding and but with that comes like complications you could have anytime you get a regular illness that most of us can fight or so what happened to him like when he died he um he was just having trouble breathing and he um like he was asthmatic as well and he was a smoker and just by as his best efforts to quit smoking he never quit so anyway um he was having trouble breathing he had some sort of illness and um like bacterial or viral I don't remember but he went to the hospital and he was really short of breath like I guess he was kind of refusing to go in the beginning and then the doctor suggested putting him on a ventilator because I guess that's how extreme it was and uh but once he got on that it was like all downhill from there and yeah like I want to say like I said before I was celebrating af after his death because I felt free and he was one of my main abusers in life but like thinking back on that time I still f like I'm somehow in my mind able to separate the two at times because I kind of was forced to do that I was forced to sort of it was always like there were other things things and it was like sorry 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 like our family was just so much in the habit of saying sorry and everything's better after that and and then like I said about kind of disconnecting from some of the real traumatic stuff like and then being gaslit and manipulated and everything it just kind of like I said very complex so as much as I felt free and was celebrating after in my own little way like I um still do feel for any sort of person who's like at the end of their life and was like fearful and like sick and and then me and my brother managed to make it from BC back to Manitoba on the same flight and we got there right in time where it was like things were not looking good and and yeah, we had to take him off life support because the dialysis wasn't doing anything. Like his kidneys and started to shut down. So his good kidney or his better, no, he had two bad kidneys. But with his transplant, I guess that one was shutting down. And this is just my memory of it. I haven't really thought much about it since that day, but yeah like we had to you know his like blood pressure was really extremely elevated like he was at the point of about to have a heart attack and there's some stuff that happened at the hospital that wasn't really right either like the way that they kind of treated my mom and some of the nurses or staff and I think like my mom and my aunt wrote the hospital a letter and they didn't even get back to her like super messed up but anyway um my mom was just kind of completely unaware that that was going to be like his last moments like they kind of kept saying you know he's not doing so great but when he like I don't know Maybe she's just very much in denial, which could be the case. But there were other things, too, like she was witnessing sort of neglect. I guess I shouldn't say too much because I don't want to like, get in trouble somehow. But like the nurse kind of saying like there was no point in like rotating him and stuff to like avoid bed sores and stuff. Like I still think that's pretty screwed up, but... <sighs> whatever um and yeah I just wanted to tell you like a little bit about that because you know like like I said in the very first video about the body body positivity movement like it is important to know that there are plenty of overweight people who are still healthy and they're athletic and 
they even eat right. And some people just do carry their weight differently, but we need to, I'm going to make a video for another day about this talk topic specifically about my beliefs on that and especially protecting children against that because like I personally I just know firsthand what happens when children are overweight and then the struggles that you face and like when you do decide to lose weight and stuff too and how that can impact you for life like how it impacts your self-esteem and self-worth and how other people treat you and the loose skin and just and you know you're pretty much deformed like you have um at some people like you have certain things that like a trophy I think it's called and um I just don't think children would choose that for themselves if they knew and later on in life some of those kids are going to have resentment resentment against their parents for not doing better like I'm sorry people are going to be really mad at me for saying this but and there are some kids who still go through that and maybe they just never lose and they're just happy with who they are and they have confidence and that's really great um and maybe I wish that had been me but um we're still kind of not getting to the realization that like we're talking being a child to a teen to a young adult like you're not really going to get the severe complications of being obese until probably like in your late 20s to 30s and 40s and up and we're talking like a doctor or I think numerous doctors have told me that um every single person out there who's overweight has a fatty liver to some degree so that's really scary and eye-opening. And then, um, yeah, there's just a lot of, and then, you know, like when you're not taking diabetes seriously and you're pre-diabetic and then you're on your way to becoming diabetic, like that is not something to just, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to take my medication and take my insulin like <laughs> I don't think so like you know daily needles and the cost of that and then the complications and the side effects and it, we just need to talk more about this especially when it comes to protecting children like children who aren't making these choices for themselves and like not kind of teaching discipline or and also I understand completely like when it comes to poverty like you can it's hard sometimes you can like it's like carb overload and sugar overload like the cheapest things that you can get are like you know instant noodles instant food microwave food at times and so I understand when it comes to those parents I, I do apologize I'm not I don't want to I know it's not your choice like you would love to be giving your kids like the best quality meat and veggies and fruits and everything and it's just like extremely expensive like I understand that I have to pause for a sec oh so that's my first ramble rant and uh, in this video today, I kind of just wanted to go through a list of my book when I was starting to get organized. What happened? Like, I started this book around October, and that was the same time I was getting tests for everything, like, from the psychologist. Like, having to relive all the things, like, going into detail about my life, and then um, I think it completely shut me down down I think I started my book before that and then once I got into that I completely stopped but before that I was on a roll for like getting all my points across and I guess part of it was really helpful that I did this before I saw the psychologist because it 
I guess it just allowed me to, there were things that I had forgotten about and stuff, but, um, You know, sometimes it's like, I'm always a person who has kind of like background noise on, like music, the TV or something. And so when I'm doing these and the silence is like, you know, deafening sometimes. Like, I wish YouTube would just allow, like, you know, pay their creator, like pay musicians, like something where we could have like a little background music or something. Like, come on, YouTube, you can afford to pay artists. It would just be awesome if people could do cover um like if bands want to do cover songs and things like that and not be worried about copyright and stuff it would be neat like because I remember the MySpace days like a lot of the bands I loved today or loved when I was young or from MySpace and and it was like I don't know why much <laughs> I guess I was just trying to say that like um like it just allowed me to see all types of music I wouldn't have had the chance to really know about otherwise and so what I'm saying is like if people were including music they really liked in their videos and were able to just be completely free and make cover songs and stuff it would just lead to more and more of a fan base and stuff but anyway <laughs> so these are, I'm just going to read through some of the, I kind of started to organize parts of my book. And so these are like other topics I might make, um, different videos, like some things I have mentioned before, but I'm just going to reread some. So when I operate in my home daycare, um, I think I talk most about trauma. I might I don't know really how far I can really get with things. And then there's my mom, the whole subject on her. I've kind of like said things here and there. Um, I've said some things about friendship. I keep looking at my shirt. I just really like, <laughs> it's from Walmart. <laughs> it's kind of cute. It's, I'll show it later, um, front and back, but It'll look even better when I'm, like, feeling better, but, <laughs> yeah, um, it's just catching my eye because it's nice and pink. I'm not, like, looking at my, you know what, <laughs> anyway, um, even some good childhood memories, um, high school, I have a, hopes and dreams section, family, anxiety, what happened to me at birth, like I, my birth was a traumatic birth for my mother and I almost died apparently, and you know, elementary school, how awful that really was, like when a kid's really becoming kind of forced to become independent at such a young age and you know if I wake up late one day and I didn't prepare my lunch and I'm going to school without that or or um even breakfast or um or waking up late and not having enough time to bathe when I really should have or clothes that were really like, you know, chub rub, like getting holes in my pants and then just being, having to sew them instead of get new pants. Cause like we couldn't afford that or no one was willing to get it for me. But anyway, just how those early years were really hard. Like, cause I'm sure part of t the bullying had to do with just me as an autistic child and how I was just weird or awkward as it was but then not being not having basic needs at times and then being like smelly or dirty and and like dirty clothes and dirty hair and anyway 
Um, my cats. I have like a really sad story about my... I had three cats for from age 19 to 28 when I first had my meltdown. And uh, I'll get into another day, but I'll just quickly say that for anyone who is curious about that. Like when I had my... When I was first getting help for my mental health and I had a little bit of a breakdown, I just really was so depressed. I was like in my room all the time and I just thought my cats deserved better and because I wasn't giving them the attention they deserved and I was working split shifts and stuff too. So uh, by the time the weekend came, I needed to do errands or clean laundry or whatever it was and I just felt like I was they just deserved better but if I could go back in time I wouldn't have done that because that led to that just made the breakdown 10,000 times worse and I still like miss them to this day and they were like literally my children and I'm trying not to cry <laughs> oh yeah, everyone knows how much I love my cats and how much they mean to me. Oh my god, I said I wasn't going to cry and here I am. Oh well, it's real raw emotion. <laughs> anyway, I'll make a, a video about that more in detail about that time in my life. But, yeah. I used to really look down on people who would rehome their pets. Like, how could you do that? Like, but, like, because I, I knew some people who it seemed like their families kind of would just, like, go through pets, like, and it was like, what is going on here? Like, a new cat, a new dog every free, few years, and I really, so that's kind of just how I looked at it all the time, but then, and then, you know, people would move or in breakups and things like that get rid of their cats and dogs and or animals and I could never understand how anyone could do that but then it happened to me and I understand but yeah that's a whole period of my life that's gonna be like a lot of videos just the whole beginning stages of getting help and and where that led me and it actually put me in like a really dangerous situation. I had an alarm set and it just interrupted my video, but um, oh, anyway, yeah, um, first getting my help, but first getting help and stuff put me like in this like really bad environment because I like moved from where I was to this like house with it was supposed to be students and it was like a really bad situation I'll have to talk about another time and um let's see middle school drugs and alcohol just like kind of my experience what I've done what I've used like you know what I said about abusing alcohol to cope in in social social situations as an autistic person like just a little example I used to if I went to the bar and I was like sober like say I had no drinks or one drink it would just be so overwhelming like I don't know like at the time I didn't know I was autistic so I don't know if it was like the music and the lights and the chatter and or what it was or just all the like faces <laughs> like it's not like I thought all eyes on me but I just felt so uncomfortable in my skin that's when I kind of first started using alcohol oh because I couldn't really like have fun and even dance with my friends either like without drinking I just was like you know if <laughs> everyone's showing off their moves and I'm just like <laughs> stiff as a board until like I and then I really started I like I guess I don't know it kind of sucks because I did have a lot of fun like you know getting drunk and 
dancing was sort of like a release but there's no way that I could have been able to like do all like that with being sober <laughs> like so it's kind of it would be nice if um like future generations or anybody like young and old if we could start embracing just being comfortable in our own skin somehow and like having more kind of like sober events and stuff that would be really cool if that could somehow take off like more sober bars and I'm not like I haven't I said I don't drink and um I'm not exactly straight edge but like for example like I can go weeks and weeks without drinking and I went to dinner with my friend like a week ago and I had like one drink so I just want to say that too that I'm not I'm not trying to lie to say that I don't drink it's just that I do it very responsibly now which was not like me before and I'm kind of I am at the point at times in my life where I'm like I think I should just quit altogether like I see what it does to people and what it's even done to me in the past and then how my dad was when he was drinking when I was young and it like ruins relationships and changes people and puts people at risk of um being taken advantage of and stuff and I know like you'll, people could argue well that's the individual person and not alcohol like because some people can handle it but there's a lot of addicts out there and I know when you're young there's like peer pressure to take shots and stuff when you don't feel like having it or but I just think a lot of us like even people when it was really young before alcohol and drugs like they uh you know they were just confident kids and like they were participating in all kinds of things and then it just seemed that everyone got into this stage where it's like no one was comfortable in their skin or like no one thought life was fun unless you were drunk or on something and that's just not true you know we just need to learn to somehow comfortable in our skin and here's my Coraline cup oh <laughs> I love that movie it was the first movie I ever saw 3d and I was just so amazed but I just love it anyway like it's just so it's just so unique and it's it, kind of is weird and whatever it's like not for everybody but I love it <sighs> anyway back to this so this video is probably going to be mostly just about reading this list and kind of just going off on whatever I feel like talking about little stories here and there okay listen okay I took a little short video I took a short video about my fridge because remember how I was talking about my fridge? Listen to this. Like, freaking tell me that's not someone talking through my s fridge. Like, there's a speaker or camera or something. <laughs> freaking hate that I want to take the fridge and just throw it away but I need it for like fruits and veggies and things Ugh. drives me nuts anyway um where was I just little things like that like when you're an ADHD person I mean I think anyone would kind of get distracted by that when it sounds like demons are speaking from your fridge but I get distracted by a lot of things and that you've noticed when I'm doing these videos and that's why there's a lot of pauses and stuff. But um today we're drinking green matcha. <laughs> I'm out of my dirty chai and I'm trying to 
being someone who doesn't have a lot of money, I'm trying to just use what I have there for groceries right now and kind of just go as long as I can without having to buy something. I have like lots of things I don't just go to often, whether, well, I'm not even supposed to have rice, for example, but I'm not stuck potatoes either. <laughs> I have things there that I need to just get rid of. But... <clears throat> Anyway, um, employment, college, eating disorders, roommates, oh my god, roommates and apartment. <laughs> oh, I have some stories. I thought maybe, this is kind of uncomfortable because I don't know who's watching these, but I guess I don't really care, but I thought maybe I would talk about sex someday, like, as an autistic person, as... An abused person as somebody who's lost a lot of weight and gained a lot of weight and lost a lot of weight and gained a lot of weight like issues I have with my body and but I know everyone likes talking about sex baby so <laughs> maybe I will someday and dating fibromyalgia I still have to kind of go more into that um, oh, so, yeah, some of these are things called, like, leaving Winnipeg for good, road trip to BC, breaking point and stuff, so I'd have to open them up and really read more. Love on the spectrum. Even my ex-boyfriends. <laughs> When I lived in the North End in Winnipeg, that experience. <laughs> medical, I guess just like medical things that I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, I think that's most of it. And then I read that other list before on my phone of things, but um... Yeah. Maybe we should pick one subject here and read a little bit about it with just completely blind because I don't even remember what. Should I pick something good for once? Something more positive? Let's see what Hopes and Dreams is about. What? Nope. Oh, why is it like this? Oh. Hmm. Hopes and Dreams, how this impacted my life. How I don't really have anyone. No one has my back. If I had children, they would be at risk. If anything happened to me, new alone in a new city, things can change. I can find my people, rebuild at this, rebuild, but at this present moment, I feel like my ultimate, ultimate goal is dead. To raise a family, get married, I refuse to be anyone's property. I lived through 18 plus years where I felt like a prisoner. Even the thought of a simple argument daily or every other day, it makes me recoil in fear. Is it worth it? It's never, it never had been before. Will the future be different this time? Does self-awareness diagnosis improve interpersonal relationships? Only time will tell. If it's something you really want, go after it. Well, I don't want to be alone, but I don't want to compromise who I am again. I don't have any healthy relationships to look up to, especially monogamous. There's always scandal, abuse, someone wears the pants, cheating. I don't think my heart could take anything less than a fully honest, open, loving, respectful relationship. 
I don't want to bring my own children into the world anymore and it kills me. I feel like I lost my sense of purpose. I know it's never too late. Things can change for the better. Maybe one day down the road I will adopt or foster. I have zero fear of being from being an ex daycare lady to becoming a mother. It's the state of the world. My toxic genetics, not having any support. Here I was thinking that I was picking a topic that was um positive, like hopes and dreams and then it's about my hopes and dreams going down the toilet but anyway um where what i don't know what part of the last video got cut off but i just said i don't want to bring my own children into the world anymore and it kills me i feel like i lost my sense of purpose i know it's never too late things can change for the better maybe one day down the road i will adopt or foster I have zero fear of being an ex-daycare lady to becoming a mother. It's the state of the world. My toxic genetics, not having any support. It can't be just me and them. Can it? I don't know. There's so many things I wish I had the capability of doing, and honestly... What? Honestly, if you just... so I said people are in desperate need of help and they do they need it now and there are enough wealthy people on the planet to get all of us out of poverty one thing I would love is to create a non-profit charity to get a proper diagnosis from a psychologist oh so this is before I had that Oh, one thing I'd love is to create a nonprofit charity to get a proper diagnosis from a psychologist. Those one hour rush sessions with a psychiatrist are necessary for many, but also complete BS. They think they have they think they have the education and know how to sit with a person for an hour and be able to confidently diagnose. I say impossible, but I guess they're there to see if you're really in danger to yourself or others if you need medication, and sometimes they do offer other resources, which is nice. Anyways, my psychology assessment is going to be about $2,000. Who has that kind of money, especially unemployed, undiagnosed, disabled people? There's help out there, but you're on a year-long wait list sometimes. It's really sad. I don't even want to get into how I feel about the government for this. And they're just letting people down left and right. Anyway, again, you're amazing. Or how amazing would it be <laughs> to be able to get people their proper diagnosis for acceptance, help, disability status, other support, get back to work, and know your boundaries and be able to share that with your employer and learn more about yourself than ever than you ever knew before. Honestly, I wish I could find people therapy or honestly, I wish I could fund people therapy from abusive families growing up. They deserve it. Whether someone plans to work or not, I hope someone someday whether someone plans to work or not, I hope someday in the future they make it possible. Free therapy and massages for all, I say. <laughs> Learning better techniques to communicate, send, set boundaries, gain more self-confidence, be heard and understood and supported. Getting diagnosed quickly and misdiagnosed is dangerous. You're asking people to relieve their trauma, get rushed in to explain the depths of it. You'll never fully understand in an hour. Then medicate people instead of treat people and get them therapy. Drugging victims based on what they say. They don't even check for real chemical imbalances in my experience with psychiatrists. I respect them, their desire to help others, to safely and effectively get medication to those who desperately need it. 
out of crisis. I just don't respect the method that is used for all because you have to pay out of pocket to do it the other way. And that's probably not up to the psychiatrist. It's all the time they're allotted. I could be com I could be complete wrong about this, but I've never I haven't edited th this yet, and I haven't read it to myself in a really long time. But I could be completely wrong about this. But I've seen several at times in my life, and all they want to do is medicate me. I'm fearful of medications for taking away my senses, taking away any parts I actually like about myself. Putting me in danger of overdosing, becoming dependent, the side effects, absolutely not for me. I'm a survivor of childhood abuse and I'm autistic. Aside from that, thankfully I'm not a danger to myself or others and maybe some medications could help me focus or be more productive, but I worry about the long-term long effects. The two experiences I had with medication, they made me nauseous and I stopped taking them immediately. It was too soon to know if they helped in a matter of days. Like many of us autistic people, there are plenty of jobs we're capable of. What we're intolerant of is the environment. If it's toxic, subjected to bullying, irregular schedules, it can worsen our symptoms and make working impossible. How about we take the funds for medication and put it towards mandatory ethics classes in schools? <laughs> It would help significantly get the wheels turning before about it before everyone enters the workplace. I also think ethics class should be a mandatory class in all schools starting in elementary school. It would teach children about bullying, the root of it. Perhaps it would save a lot of children and parents grief. Prevent physical and verbal abuse. Kids will be kids, but I know for a fact classes like that introduced at a young age can leave a long-lasting positive impact and change lives. It can change the minds of the bullies and help help victims. As we know, many bullies are victims. It would help to respect and understand diversity and inclusion. It would help. It would keep up the momentum of equal rights, especially diversity, and reduce old-fashioned thinking and low tolerance to others. I want to open a nonprofit charity that helps people get their diagnosis. I think I, at the very bottom, I kind of was rewriting like things I had text. I was kind of like voice memoing myself and putting little notes and things like to get organized. So that was just the very beginning of hopes and dreams. Like, do I think I'm going to open a nonprofit one day? Probably not like I have no idea where like even to begin with that but and I don't if someone takes my idea and they run with it and they do this for people then that's awesome but you know I have thought about this because I what I'm not going to say anything personal about it but I did do a charity job once where I would just call people literally right out of the phone book and and some people were generous enough to donate, but they knew the cause at least because it was a popular cause that kind of everyone's heard at least once in their life, most people in Canada. But, um, I wonder if that's illegal. <laughs> Maybe I should. I don't know if calling people out of the phone book is. Anyway, I just thought if we were doing that for this thing why couldn't I do something like that and raise money where I could help get people diagnosed who really need it like they need that reassurance they need that validation they need to know more about themselves they can um they need to be protected by the government so that they can qualify for to be disabled but still go to work but at least have that to fall back on if something bad happens because you know some as much as I say like I'm gonna go back to work and uh, there's just no telling what will happen once I'm actually there like it's 
it is scary at times because I've just had so many bad experiences. And the truth is, like, when I first got help for my diagnosis, I was 28 years old and I had probably about two years off. So from babysitting at 11 years old to going to college, being in high school, but working pretty much consistently the full way through to 28 years old, I like really had that breakdown and I took like almost two years off and then and then I opened my home daycare for four years and then now I've had like two years off again <laughs> and that is kind of like probably classic like autistic burnout um you know things just weren't things were great until I decided to move to the country then things took like a nosedive and <laughs> So that's will be another video, but <laughs> anyway, um, see now, you want to take off your hot harness? She says, Yes, get me out of here. Does it need a wash? There. That's better. Anyway, um. Oh, the neighbor's hammering. Maybe it's a sign to stop. <laughs> anyway. So what was I saying? Just pretty much work. I just. Is that realistic? Is it legal? Is it who knows? Like, where do you get started? I don't have the money. I don't have the credit to take out a business loan. Oh, no, people probably wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't know how to even begin that, but it would be cool. It's kind of a dream. And maybe it would be possible someday, though. Or maybe some will take my idea and go do it. And if they do, that's awesome. I just hope they do it without, um, you know, it seems like all these non-profits and all these charities, like, where's the money going? Like, are people being really helped? Or are you just sending people to Disneyland once in their life? Or, I don't know. Right? If I were to open a nonprofit to actually help people get diagnosed and that type of thing, I would make it where it's like I just make a certain amount per year and that's it. And whatever extra is extra to help as many people as I could. I don't know if anything like that exists. Maybe it does, and that's why there's a year long wait list. Yeah. <laughs> Honey, don't scratch my jacket. <laughs> anyway, felt good rambling after a few days. I think I'm going to pause this video, make this one video on its own, and then I'm going to pick a next subject to talk about. So maybe I'll have a few videos for a few days again. But thanks for listening to this. And Ninja says goodbye. <laughs> I appreciate people who have been coming to watch my videos and don't forget to like, su subscribe, <laughs> and so I can continue doing it and that hopefully it reaches more of the disabled community and allies and and lonely people in the world like me if you just want to join me and listen to my rambles that's cool too <laughs> okay have a good day